my name is Peter Mokara. I have the pleasure and the privilege to chair this first session. Uh, my first duty, but this is also a pleasure, to express my acknowledgement uh, to the integration power of the European Union, putting political priority and providing funding for this very important and growing We'll go back to this, but just have a start with the introductory speeches. It's my privilege to invite Katharine Parker, Prorector of the Central European University, for the introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, say a few words at the beginning of this event. Um, I, uh, in April, uh, April 14th, uh, there was a uh, conference that I also had the uh, uh, luck and fortune to uh, introduce on the uh, publication, the occasional publication of my books 3, the um, Magnet Information Policy Index. Um, that conference um, addressed various issues about uh, uh, Magnet Integration, uh, in particular with respect to the equal opportunities. Uh, education and labor markets. And I thought it was a very uh, good occasion to have a somewhat uh, broader overview of the uh, challenges and opportunities uh, that emerge uh, in the course of um, integration of, uh, of migrants. And now I'm very glad that we have an opportunity to, as it were, follow up this topic and have a zoom in on the one particular aspect and have a closer look at the uh, issue of uh, labor market integration in particular in Hungary, uh, discussing the opportunities in the midst for third country nationals. We're very fortunate to have the opportunity again to uh, cooperate with the uh, British Embassy and the British Council. I'm going to have the summit in Birmingham again. And uh, I'm also very glad that uh, we have uh, some new partners in this, especially the uh, Monterey Institute, which uh, took a leading part in this project. and. Uh, we're also very grateful for the assistance of the uh, Soviet Union for the part of the time. Um, now, integration, of course, has many aspects, issues of uh, discrimination, education, which are nat very natural subjects of study uh, at this university, and these things have to do with uh, events that happen in people's heads. But, uh, of course, there is an economic reality behind uh, all this, and that's the opportunity for people to find proper integration in, uh, in the labor market. And uh, um, it's also a question, obviously, for the whole country, because um, having uh, people who are coming here um, and uh, taking up work in our, uh, in our country is also something that brings possible opportunities um, and economic benefits. This is a, a very good topic for Central European University. Uh, the university has a very clear mission to uh, engage uh, theory and practice, to uh, look at the uh, policy implications of uh, various uh, overarching themes, smaller or broader themes, uh, <coughs> social change. And uh, we have a commitment to looking at uh, real life problems um, which affect the, uh, the lives of, uh, of many individuals. It's also a, a good topic for uh, CEU as uh, on a previous occasion because our community is a very international community and many members of the uh, CEO community have a first and personal experience of the uh, challenges and opportunities that stem from uh, trying to uh, integrate in uh, the labor market as uh, um, So many thanks um, to all of you for coming from uh, Martin um, to uh, assist this, uh, this event uh, on behalf of CEO for uh, to my foundation and I'll uh, share with you that. Uh, Director, before giving the floor to you, I would like to express our appreciation and acknowledgement for the university. I think this is really <coughs> topic for you from one side. And thank you both uh, for this fantastic site. It's a pleasure Monday morning, morning to be sitting in such a place, but also Thank you very much for the moral support and the technical contribution. So, then the next speaker will be the director of the British Council, 
Mr. Simon Ingram Hill. We are really privileged having you here and we appreciate very much your personal interest and the interest of the British Council towards these this issues related to migration. Your presence here is a very important political, moral and technical support for us. Also, thank you for supporting us in the organizing process. Thanks very much. Um, Fovos, uh, Captain Forkosh, or CEU, uh, Peter Mokolov, uh, Professor of Public Policy, Pantare, dear guests, of course I'm delighted to be here this morning um, at the uh, beginning of this conference to discuss the challenges for labour market integration in Hungary. Um, as uh, uh, Dr. Forkosh has just mentioned, uh, in mid-April, uh, when the British Council launched with its partners the results of the third instalment of the Migration Integration Policy Index, MIPEX 3 for short, because it's the third one in the series, um, those at the event which was hosted by the CEU, uh, with very strong participation from the CEU as well as other partners, um, those at the, the event were, I think, very much encouraged by the level of the debate and the importance attached by the many speakers and participants to the situation in Hungary, hence today. Uh, MIPEX 3, just to make a comment about MIPEX 3 for a moment, uh, involved 31 countries in Europe and North America and was presented and indeed accepted as an important transparent and objective tool for EU, EU policymakers in assessing comparing, contrasting, and suggesting improvements to the integration policies of all our countries. There were seven policy areas covered by MIPEX 3, and the April event, which <coughs> we referred to, discussed three of them, anti-discrimination policy, education, and labor market mobility. Today's conference, I suspect, will overlap the most with this third area, labour market mobility, but touch at least in part on the other two. And we'll want to go further with the purpose of continuing to draw attention to policymakers in Hungary recommending improvements for the future. We have noted elsewhere, and it was highlighted in the MIPEX uh, 3 documents, that Hungary itself has shown real leadership in anti-discrimination legislation and should be proud to share best practice with others. But, on the other hand, it has also recognized that it has some way to go before it can claim good practice, for example, in the educational arena. Discrimination and outright racism is certainly something that is faced by immigrants in many countries not least in the UK, though we have seen significant <coughs> strides forward for migrant communities as anti-discrimination legislation has become stronger over the last few decades. At the same time, the 2007 MIPEX 2 report criticised the United Kingdom for not being well enough prepared and overly bureaucratic in dealing with the large number of EU citizens coming to the UK from the 2004 EU accession countries, including, of course, Hungary. That said, our Equality Act of 2010 has provided a new framework to address a number of our shortcomings in policy to benefit migrant, <coughs> the migrant population and to advance equality of opportunity and contribute to a more equal society, while at the same time preventing the unfair treatment of individuals and protecting their rights. These principles underpin a number of the projects that the British Council is involved with in Hungary, as elsewhere. Examples here include empowerment training for Roma students entering university, 
English language training for the public administration and Roma interns, where we work closely with the Open Society Foundation <coughs> here. Projects with communities in Hervesh County, and as many of you will know, Hervesh County is a county that has its own fair share of disadvantaged groups. And leadership training for diverse groups of students in schools in Budapest. In all the protection of individual rights and the fulfillment of their expectations and potential is close to our stated objectives. Just as is the importance of projects and conferences like this one that bring people together to share best practice and identify areas of improvement. Turning back to the subject of today's conference, I would anticipate that one arena you will be looking at is how Hungary can put in place a better strategy to attract suitable migrants, many of whom will be ethnic Hungarians from neighboring countries. Attracting suitable talent from other countries, a focus of the, EU pres the Hungarian EU presidency in one of the, um, uh, one of the informal meetings um, that uh, Hungary was hosting um, in the educational arena, by the way. But um, the attracting of suitable talent from other countries is, after all, very much at the heart of integration strategies. And Hungary has its own set of challenges to want to make this more evident. Just to close, I would like to um, thank the organisers once again for today's conference. I'd like particularly to thank uh, CEU for hosting and um, well, we're, we've been collaborating before, we'll be collaborating in the future, I'm quite sure, on, on, on subjects which are uh, close to all of our hearts. Um, and uh, I look forward to our collaborations in the future. And thank you um, for our collaboration in this event, and thank you for offering me the opportunity to say some words. So thank you very much, and uh, a successful day to you and successful presentations and discussions for the rest of the morning. Thank you very much. Well, I give the floor for myself. Thank you very much once again for this introductory speech and I have to say the Hungarian research community appreciates very much the activities of British Council in this field and I <coughs> strongly promise you we don't limitate ourselves today on only the labor market issue. We will right. discuss in a broader terms, including the issues of discrimination, segregation, whatever, and education also in this field. So, a uh, good introduction should be short. Uh, I think we, we, there are two overlapping ideas behind this workshop. First, to present the empirical evidence, the suggestions, the proposed scenarios made by the research of Pantare, uh, supported by the EU fund. But from the other side, nearly all all of you contributed in some way to this research and all we are stakeholders of a potential dialogue on migration in Hungary. The Hungarian policy making, and also that's more or less true at EU level, has a kind of double bind, a schizophrenic situation facing the challenges of migration. From one side, the demographic processes, the labor market interest would be, I would say, pro-migrant. But from the other side, uh, national security reasons, xenophobia, even paranoia sometimes in some parts of public administration, but also in the public opinion, are uh, rather against migration in this field. And what is certainly, uh, at the moment, there is no broad strategy in Hungary for tackling issues of migration, partly 
uh, presently by understandable reasons, and do, uh, no doubt the <coughs> present situation of facing the, the, the crisis management and the short-term interest of the Hungarian policy making are marginalized, partly for understandable reasons. But if we look at the future, the situation is quite different. And there is a lot of elements in Hungarian policy making for shaping a good strategy. But maybe the most important one, there is no broad framework for dialogue, debating the very controversial issues of migration from different perspectives. There are arguments pro and co from different social positions, from different professional perspectives. And I hope this workshop will be one step, one milestone in an ongoing process. Also, British Council is offering, CEL is offering uh, this type of opportunities. And we have to think about different options, different issues of migration today, not just limiting ourselves for this nice research, I have to say, but using this opportunity to thinking in a strategic way and on, the, on an evidence-based analysis how to shape realistic policy options for the Hungarian future developments. So that's for the introduction. And now it's my pleasure to invite Professor Governess to make this presentation. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, you all very much for coming. Uh, I'm really glad that this topic uh, had so much interest, and I would like to especially thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, present uh, some parts of my research at this uh, event. What I'm going to talk about is the European migration <coughs> and uh, the situation of uh, immigrants in European labor markets. And I'm going to take you through three themes. Now, the first one is the demographic context and the need for immigrants in Europe. Now, then I'll take you through some statistics about where we actually have some immigrants in Europe and how they do. And finally, I'll provide you with uh, immigration and integration policy. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you for. Uh, now, can you see that? Uh, I'll take you through immigration and integration policy perspectives. Now, concerning the demographic background, uh, Europe faces a number of. Can you see it a bit? Okay, how shall we do this? Maybe uh, I just move the computer over here. Okay, now well, this is to work. Is this, is this better? Okay. Yeah, okay, perfect. So, I'm, okay. Uh, the demographic background. Now, uh, Europe faces a number of uh, challenges concerning its uh, demography. Uh, the first one and the sort of prominent one everybody talks about is its aging population. Uh, this is connected to scarcity of skilled labor, where Europe doesn't seem to be able to, to educate and train uh, sufficient numbers of sufficiently skilled uh, workers. <coughs> now this uh, causes uh, what I call the dynamic loss in the economy, innovation deficits, which I'll talk about uh, in a while. And it also causes problems in the financial sector and social security system. Now the recent crisis adds to the problems. Uh, because on the, on the background of aging population, too few young workers, we have on top of that uh, rising risk aversion. So not only we have fewer people that would bring, that would uh, feel the innovation potential, but also those people seem to be more risk averse given the financial and economic crisis. Now this results in economic decline, or at least not uh, enough dynamics in the economy, and negative attitudes towards immigrants. And uh, you've seen this uh, happening in all over Europe, uh, rising uh, uh, fears of immigration and some times we observe signals that some people would like to <coughs> fortress Europe without immigration. Uh, if you look at few statistics, um, we see that the share of working age population is decreasing in Europe. This is projection from 2005 to 2020. 
and we see most countries with red bars, this means the share of working age population is expected to decline over the next uh, 15 years or so. There are only a few exceptions. Uh, so in fact, intra-European mobility, what we should, should the, the message we should get from this is that intra-European mobility is not sufficient to alleviate the problem of aging population. Because even if these few countries, even if all these people would leave these countries and go to the other countries, this is not sufficient. Most countries have red bars. So reallocation of workers is not going to work. The picture is even, even more clear if you look at old age dependence ratios. These are, this is the share of uh, elderly people in the population. And we see it's expected to rise in all over Europe. Now this means, and I'm coming back to the innovation potential, we see aging population, this means lower shares of young workers, young and mobile workers, and as we know, it's especially the younger workers that bring in the, that are mobile and bring in new ideas, and this uh, seems to be a problem uh, that we do not have that many uh, of such people in Europe. Um, but should we hope for intra-European uh, migration to somehow cushion the effects of aging? Well, I, I argued not, and this picture even uh, confirms that 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 uh, expectation even stronger. We see that mobility in Europe is quite low anyway, so the mobility would not help too much, and it's low anyway. So uh, what we need is immigration from outside the European Union. Uh, we asked, in a different research project, we asked uh, 234 labor market experts from all over Europe. This was sort of a, a, a we wanted to gain some insights into, okay, is this argument, or is, is this picture somehow <coughs> consistent with most, with, with what experts think about this. So we surveyed uh, these labor market experts and the results were quite strong in the sense that 89% of them says that EU needs at least as many immigrants as it has now, and 57.7 say that actually Europe needs more or many more immigrants. There was <coughs> somehow somewhat less conviction that the EU needs low-skilled migration, low-skilled immigration. The corresponding numbers were 60.7 and 27.3. However, almost all of those experts say that the EU needs at least as many high school migrants and 80% of them say that, they, that, that the EU needs more or many more high school migrants. Uh, is this finding sensitive to the crisis? We find not really. The long term need for, immigrant, for immigrants is, seems to be a robust, a robust uh, finding and a robust phenomenon. So, there is need for immigrants, and the question now is to be had, and how do they look like, so migrants in Europe. If you look at this table, we see the shares of immigrants in population in well, EU27. Uh, we see quite some variation. Some countries, especially in the new member states, have very, very low shares of uh, foreign-born or people or foreign citizens. In the rest of Europe, in EU15, we observe variation. Most countries have actually substantial proportions of, of immigrants. And if you look at the trends, again, quite some variation, but prevalently growing numbers of, of immigrants. If you look at Hungary, there is a steep, quite a steep increase in uh, immigration. If you look at the Czech Republic back here, this figure still says something like 0 0.4, 1.3, 0.6%. The recent figure, the most recent figure, is 4.5% of, of labor force is foreign born in the Czech Republic. So it, it, it is, this is quite a fluid uh, of migration. It's, it's about flows of people. So uh, this is a static view, but uh, there is quite some, some dynamics in how immigrant populations change in, in uh, Europe. If you look at Germany, the interesting fact is that immigration is on decline there, and I 
should also tell you that without post-enlargement immigration, Germany would have negative migration flows. Despite the transition arrangements, so many people came to Germany from the new member states that they actually, uh, actually um, caused uh, Germany to have positive immigration rates. But without that, they, 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 they shared the, uh, Germany would have negative uh, migration. And also, that's a new phenomenon, Germans are leaving. Okay? Germans are leaving. Uh, so uh, it's the, the, the immigrants from the new member states actually compensated for that uh, trend that Germans are on net on leaving Germany, which is quite a you know given the history over the past few years that's quite a quite a change. Now, how are these migrants? Are they educated? Well, you know, the usual perception is migrants are those people who clean the streets. Uh, is this really is this really the is this really what the data tell us? Well, uh, if you look at their education, what we observe is that, let's just have a look here, EU15, this is the share of, of highly educated natives, uh, medium educated natives, and low educated natives. If you look at immigrants from, uh, well, immigrants uh, put all, the, um, all the immigrants, then we see that there are the, the share of high school immigrants is larger than the natives. And, there are, <coughs> and, and uh, if you look at the immigrants from non-EU countries, we see again the same picture that immigrants are slightly more educated than the natives. This is the case also for Hungary, for example, where the share of high school immigrants, well, the, the share of high school people and immigrants is <coughs> higher than the corresponding figure for the natives. So at least from the data, that picture that immigrants are low school is not substantiated. <coughs> oh, although one should say that some countries do have uh, do have uh, less skilled immigrants. Now, if you look at the, uh, if, you, if you try to summarize this evidence in Central and Eastern Europe, we have few immigrants, which is not so good given the the demographic uh, problems. But their numbers are uh, are growing, and they are relatively skilled. If you look at the rest of Europe, in EU15, the situation is uh, different across uh, different countries. For example, Ireland, Denmark, and the UK, the UK have substantial populations of skilled migrants. They seem to be able to attract uh, more skilled immigrants, whereas Austria, Germany, and the Netherlands attract less skilled immigrants. The reasons, I like to, I like to wonder about this, but uh, this has to do with immigration policy. Uh, and also not only the formal policy, the explicit policy, but also some tested policies and the perception of these countries among potential immigrants. Now the question would be what policies are needed? Because although immigrants are, let's say, fairly educated, uh, we do see them in jobs which are less skilled. And we see observe some downskilling. Uh, people with higher education do lower skilled jobs. So we seem to have, we do have some problems uh, concerning uh, well, immigration in, in Europe. It's not only as, as trivial as to attract new immigrants, it is okay, we have demographic problems, and the solution is to import uh, young and able and uh, working and strong attached to the market immigrants. Uh, we also need, uh, well, the, the, that, the, those policies should be uh, more fine tuned, and also we need uh, integration policies. So let's have a look at those. They, the background, as I, as I mentioned, they have bad demographics, um, <coughs> need immigrants, at least that's what experts say, at least that's what we, 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 we can easily argue based on uh, the European <coughs> demography. Uh, empirical evidence on the effects of, you know, many people, many policymakers, and media, you, you observe this in the, in, the, in, the, in the discourse, you observe that many people fear immigration. So people say, okay, these immigrants are taking our jobs. You, see, you know the Polish plumber argument and similar things. So we actually uh, run a big project about this, and we try to find out, okay, is this really true? Is the Polish plumber really taking the jobs of, uh, of, 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 of an Irish plumber or a British plumber, etc.? Uh, 
general the evidence is that the effect of migration on immigration on native population is generally non-negative. Uh, there might be some local reallocation, of course, uh, but there are also many positive effects documented. So, an example in Ireland, what we find that uh, in, you know, Ireland got really enormous influx of immigrants after one. So, this is a good good case study. If you want to find negative effects, uh, then Ireland would be the the first case to look at because they have enormous immigration. And now, part of it, okay, such an enormous immigration should have caused some if the arguments are true, should have caused some trouble there. Uh, what we find is that there was very, very little of it. Uh, even in sectors where some displacement took place, the natives find, found jobs elsewhere. So the unemployment rate of the natives did not go up. There was some relocation, but on aggregate, there was no uh, negative effect on the Irish economy. By the contrary, the strong economic growth in Ireland seemed to have been also fueled by those a large number of immigrants. Um, we don't have many immigrants in Central Eastern Europe, uh, but we do have large numbers of, of immigrants in EU15, but their integration is a challenge, as you also know from my text, where uh, integration policies are well documented and seem to be quite problematic in many countries. Um, we also asked the same experts in the same survey just to get some insights into, into what policies do they think uh, might work. We provided them a number of options. And what we found is that most of them favor job dependent immigration. Of course, this is about economic migration. Okay, there is humanitarian migration. We are not concerned with that in this. In this in this, in this uh, presentation, that's a different story. But here, talking about economic migration, job development migration was, the, was uh, one of the two most favored uh, principles of uh, immigration policy. And the second one was positive selection on education or skill. Okay, not so surprising uh, for this audience, but. Uh, apparently not so much embraced by uh, those who design immigration policies. Also, selection based on language skill got quite some support, and open borders. It's open borders. I went that in. Was, was the, was the, received quite some, uh, quite some, uh, was quite some, quite favorable. Uh, okay, now let's assume that we, for a moment, have solved the. We, we have um, we have uh, enough immigrants in our countries in considering the numbers. We are able to attract the high school immigrants from the pool of poor <coughs> immigrants. Uh, but then this all can work only if these immigrants are integrated. So the argument about aging population and the need for immigrants. And then we say, okay, now we have enough immigrants, but what still might, might be missing is that these immigrants might be not integrated in the society. <coughs> so the question is, are the immigrants that we have now integrated? And if not, how can we uh, facilitate their integration? If we look at the European Y data set, uh, and we compare the risk of poverty for immigrants and natives. Now, if the bar is here, one, one means that immigrants and natives have the same probability of being in poverty. If the bar is above one, this means that immigrants have higher probability of being in poverty than natives. The blue bars mean non-EU immigrants, the reddish bars mean EU immigrants, and if the bar is white, it means that the difference between natives and, and immigrants is not significant. In any case, the largest number of bars is about one. This means immigrants seem to have a lot higher risk of being in poverty than natives across Europe, with a few exceptions, <coughs> uh, with a few exceptions uh, down the line. Now, the survey 215 NGOs in Europe, all across Europe, again to gain insights into what 
are the risk of social and labor market exclusion of immigrants and ethnic minorities. We find that that risk is very high. So you see this is no risk, low risk, medium risk, high risk, very high risk. Most answers are in medium, high risk or very high risk uh, for uh, exclusion of ethnic minorities and immigrant minorities. If you compare 2007 to the blue bar and 2010 to the red bar, we see actually that the, the situation has worsened. Worse. Many more people now report that there is high risk of, uh, of exclusion of those minorities. And this is indeed confirmed in this diagram, which shows that the question was, is this risk decreasing, constant, or increasing? And we see that a large proportion says the risk is increasing. These were NGOs working in the field of ethnic minority integration and immigrant integration. Many of these people were actually ethnic minorities themselves or immigrant organizations or organizations run by, run by uh, ethnic minorities or immigrant minorities. And the difference was not significant between those who were run by ethnic minorities or immigrant minorities and those who were more general uh, about uh, social inclusion of any vulnerable groups of people. Uh, what we, we try to do a simple exercise uh, to somehow gauge the um, integration challenges for different ethnic minorities for each country in Europe. And we, what we plot here is the risk of exclusion. Here is the highest risk. Five is the highest risk, mm -hmm. highest possible, so very, very high risk. One means no risk. And the trend in that risk. So this is decreasing, constant, increasing. This means the farther you are from the origin here, the higher is the risk and the more growing uh, is that risk. The message is in general that all major immigrant groups, are, most immigrant groups are at serious risk of exclusion and this risk is growing. <coughs> An example is Germany, Africans, Turks, immigrants from the former Soviet Union and from former Yugoslavia all are in the top right quadrant, that means their, their risk is very high and increasing. Generally that picture is confirmed for most EU15 countries, no, the uh, EU15 meaning countries before 2004 enlargement. You see Moroccans, Asians and Albanians in Italy. Asians seem to have quite some variation. In Italy, for example, they are more in the upper upper right quadrant, but in many countries, they enter somewhere here. They seem to, in some countries, they seem to do very well, or relatively well, let's call it. Uh, so, uh, but in general, most immigrant minorities, uh, immigrant groups in Europe are uh, at risk of social and market inclusion. Now, if you look at Central and Eastern Europe, and Hungary is a good example, these are mainly autochthonous minorities, because that's what they uh, this was a sort of, this was a research about ethnic and immigrant minorities, and they took the largest minority. So, for Central Eastern Europe, these are mostly autochthonous, autochthonous meaning not of immigrant or not of recent immigrant origin, but people who were born here, uh, and the ancestors, uh, of, uh, their, their, their parents and grandparents are from these countries. <coughs> uh, we see Roma uh, being uh, very much to the right and top of the matrix and other minorities doing relatively uh, well in these countries. How much time do I have? Now, another myth, I should say, uh, about immigrants and their integration into the labor market is that they abuse welfare. So the typical <laughs> argument is that immigrants come to a certain country because they want to get the welfare and then we, we see that, oh yes, they are more likely to be in welfare, right? To, to be in welfare, take up. So we have another a larger project about this, and uh, we've done two exercises. One was to answer the question, do immigrants really go to countries which are welfare generous? Or in other words, <coughs> if a country increases its welfare spending, does this affect further immigrants? If the, the answer is no. <coughs> We, 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 we use the, we compiled a large data set, uh, a panel data set about 
immigration into a uh, number of European countries, we run a few regressions, statistical analysis, and we found that this is not what's going on. If a country increases its welfare spending or unemployment benefits or other, it does not attract further immigration. Now, the other question that we tried to answer was, I mean, do really immigrants take up welfare more than natives? Are they really more dependent on welfare than natives? Now, how should we answer this question? Well, one possibility would be to look at the raw data. So we just, again, as in, the pre in, the, in the one of the previous slides, uh, if it's one, this means immigrants and natives have the same probability of being in welfare. If it's above one, immigrants are more likely to be in welfare than natives. This is unemployment benefits. Uh, what we see across Europe, these are European countries, and the blue bars are non-EU, the red bars are EU, the white bars are not significant, <coughs> no significant difference. We see that indeed in raw data, in most countries, we do find that immigrants are more likely to be in welfare than natives. Now, is, the, is this confirmed then? Well, I say no, because we, what we need to do is to compare likes with likes. We need to compare people in similar situation. We need to compare people with similar characteristics. So in this diagram, what we do is that we control for differences in characteristics, meaning education, age, etc., for immigrants and natives. We see that if the, if the bar here is above zero, this means that immigrants are more <coughs> likely to be in welfare than natives, etc. as far as we find that the picture is much different. Now, a, a large, no, only a few countries remain where the uh, probability of being in unemployment benefit take up is larger for uh, immigrants than natives. Well, another thing is that we need to control for eligibility. We need to compare people, well, we need to compare people in similar situation, meaning their characteristics, but also whether they are in fact eligible for unemployment benefit, for unemployment benefits in these countries. And if you do so, if you control for that, we see that in fact the picture has changed dramatically. Most countries are about at around zero, but a larger number of, of countries have immigrants less likely to be in take up of income benefits than natives. Okay, so the typical picture is this, this is what people see, but if we compare center is body with people with the same characteristics, the picture is changing already quite significantly, but if we compare people who are eligible, the picture is dramatically different. So here we argue that the whole debate is a bit Feel <coughs> informed and displaced because the the the, the true question is uh, well how to attract skilled immigrants and those who are attached to the labor market with such characteristics that they don't become so dependent. Okay, and the second question is how to enable those who are already in our countries to take up welfare benefits if needed because here we seem to seem to observe some discrimination or some barriers to welfare take-up. And welfare take-up is not only about keeping people out of jobs, it's also enabling. The unemployment benefits not only have this negative fact of, okay, I don't need to work because if I don't work, I get so much, so, so many foreigns uh, or so much, uh, so many euros. It's also about enabling people to find better jobs if they get un unemployed and to uh, sustain their uh, purchasing power and sustain their families. Uh, what are the barriers that uh, immigrant uh, minorities, immigrants typically face in the labor markets in Europe? Well, discrimination, <coughs> education, language, but also institutional barriers and internal barriers. Uh, sometimes you can call it cultural barriers coming from within the community. Uh, in some communities, uh, it's not uh, usual that women work or that you know different kinds of things. So sometimes <coughs> these might be barriers or originating from within the uh, community. Uh, sometimes it's argued that immigrants and ethnic minorities do not really want 
and in change they are happy in that situation, we should not care about this, this is what they want and this is what they have. So we asked uh, about this uh, in the same survey, about the this where okay, almost 400 uh, respondents in this one. Again, uh, non-government organizations from all over Europe, many of them representing ethnic minorities, many of them run by ethnic minorities and immigrant minorities. Uh, almost all minorities want to change their situation. 86% of all respondents and in fact here, 98% of minority respondents. Minority respondents meaning organizations run and led by ethnic minorities themselves. Uh, where are these changes needed and wanted? Paid employment, education, attitudes and housing. One could say the usual suspects, but this, this also tells me that looking at employment and labor market for the minorities is, a, is, is, is needed and has some value because this is what ethnic minorities and immigrant minorities want to change. Another question would be how? How should we do this? I'm not going to provide you with a, you know, a something answer, but I'm going to show you one interesting finding that came out from this survey. We asked about what's the preferred policy principle. How do you want to? How do you want the government or whoever uh, to change it, to help you to change the situation? Uh, and we offered a couple of options: equal treatment, specific provisions, positive discrimination, uh, other. Most respondents, a large majority of respondents, say they prefer a technical treatment. There is some room for specific provision or for positive discrimination, especially for the most vulnerable groups. The representatives of the, when, when we discussed uh, some most vulnerable groups in Europe, uh, we were some, some a bit more likely to observe these answers. <coughs> Input treatment is the, seems to be the key. So to conclude, uh, in Europe we seem to need immigrants. We need to seem we, we, we seem to need immigration from outside Europe. Uh, but immigration policies are often lacking and often even backfiring. Uh, an example would be Germany, although recently we see more positive developments there. Uh, we see that integration policy has only limited its success um, and I think some, one of the reasons is that the debate about immigration in Europe is still informed and what we need is a paradigmatic shift because we should not talk about abuse of welfare for example but about access to welfare. We should not talk about allowing governments <coughs> on our sacred soul or some kind of fortress of argument. We should talk about how to win the best race in the global competition for talent. Um, and I'm saying that so far we're missing an opportunity. Uh, we seem not to be able to uh, win the best immigrants in the global competition and we still talk about abuse whereas uh, it's more about access uh, to, to uh, all kinds of social and labor market services uh, in Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm not sure if you're taking questions. But, uh, uh, two minutes for questions. <laughs> 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 No, we, we will have time for debating by the end. But uh, no, just for clarification. Of the Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, just one question. Uh, we have some charts showing the risk of uh, social and labor <coughs> exclusion. And uh, in the Hungarian uh, chart, you spoke about non-third country nationals, that is to say EU country nationals, I think Hungarians more perfectly, but in the Italian chart, which you specifically show, uh, we didn't specify anything else, and I would be interested, for example, the Romanian population, Romanians, migrants, immigrants, in Italy. Uh, Roma, in if, in, uh, not Roma, Romania. Romanian, okay, sorry, Romanian. Uh, just to see how the different 
<coughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, we covered the four, because uh, okay, there was a limited size of the questionnaire, so we covered the four largest groups. Romanians do not yet uh, form the one of the top four groups in Italy, but indeed, that would be very interesting to compare, uh, for example, uh, immigrants, post enlargement post immigrants and other immigrants, and uh, we would be really, uh, really uh, keen on seeing this, but unfortunately, I don't have these numbers. Um, the it's possibility for clarification, clarification. You had a survey, and it was somewhere felt it is based on expert opinions. What you had? What was really the basis of all this information? Because it yeah. was not verified, and it strongly so, influences the result. Yes, thank you. So uh, I combined many, uh, <coughs> many oh, uh, last. results from. Okay, so you. you no, the very last. Survey. This one, for example. Yeah, because it seemed to be opinions of experts. No, this this of is uh, let me count 370 uh, NGO representatives, non-government organizations, who some of them are not all of them are dealing with ethnic minority issues, immigrant integration issues, etc. And I think. 30% of them are actually run <coughs> by ethnic groups concerned themselves. So uh, this is the this is the survey. All so, over Europe. Europe, yes. We we have all yes, all European countries represented here. Yes. Um, first for clarification uh, as well. In the uh, chat, uh, <coughs> you were mentioning uh, Germany. Uh, Afri Africans are uh, actually uh, tops the uh, five uh, out of the uh, other minorities. But coming to uh, Hungary, it does not come into the charts. Uh, is there any specific ah, yeah, um, reason for this? The, 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 the only reason is that we, for all the countries, for each country, we picked pick four largest groups. So, uh, of course, you know, we, we had to adapt certain rules, how to limit the dimensionality of the questionnaire to, to, to make it still, uh, you know, to have some answers, still some responses. So we, we had to uh, limit the, the survey to four large minority countries. Africans are not yet, or not, not uh, in the, at the time they were not uh, among the four largest minorities in Hungary. That's why they're not included. And of course, we would love to see you know all the ethnic minorities in these countries, but uh, also because we wanted to sort of be control for the for the reliability of the answers, uh, we we only focus on four four largest minorities. <coughs> so, thank you very much, indeed. amazing and challenging presentation, providing for us an overall frame, very broad framework for our further discussions and offering a better understanding <coughs> of the results of our Hungarian research. Also, I have to say, all our findings are consistent with the ISA report. There is really no conflicting information. Just to quotate you a few results uh, concerning the opinion of the Hungarian experts. Related to the risk uh, on the Hungarian labor market, that uh, third world uh, immigrants will contribute to the increase of unemployment in Hungarian population, 70% uh, of the Hungarian experts disagree with this statement. This is really good to know, but most of the Hungarian experts don't agree with this type of statement. Also, most of the, Hunga the uh, assessment of the Hungarian experts on the impact of the third world 
migrants on the Hungarian national economy is quite positive. The most positive judgment is from public administration and from reserve, and the most <coughs> negative from entrepreneurs and from trade unions in this field. And just one more example. Uh, 63, two thirds of the Hungarian experts told that considering everything put together, they think the presence of third world nationals in the Hungarian labor market is beneficial. Also, positive, beneficial. So, just a few comments. Then, uh, well, the, we, have, we have also some findings uh, on the situation of Africans in Hungary, and I have to say, however, the segregation in Hungary <coughs> is not too strong, and the labor market discrimination is not too strong. Uh, and the most problematic group is seasonal workers and underprivileged workers. From country perspective, I have to say, African population, uh, we have most Nigerians in, in our town, are one of the most at risk group for different type of objective <coughs> indicators of labor market discrimination. And Africans are certainly one of the less integrated groups in the Hungarian society. However, you can't compare the situation of the Hungarian integration with Italy or with Western Europe. It's quite different. So, but let's have a start. My task, as far as I've seen 25 minutes, is to focus on two issues. One is the conceptual framework of the Hungarian reserve and some key elements of thinking in terms of integration and also some key concepts related to the new phenomenon of migration throughout Europe and uh, Hungary. And this my second part of the presentation will focus on the it will be a kind of introductory part of our reserve. Uh, key questions, methodology, and so on. With the Italian situation, with France, with Germany, even last time, even Denmark has some problems with the Schengen Treaty. In Hungary, still, we don't have open and clear ethnic conflicts, no ghettos, no clear public scandals related to discrimination. There are some isolated <coughs> events, but uh, this is not really an important point, actually. If you compare to the huge challenge in Hungary of the integration of the Roma ethnic origin in Hungarian population, and you compare the migrants' integration issue, uh, there, uh, there is no real comparison in the importance for the Hungarian policy making. The question is about the different estimates for one percent of the Hungarian population and for the labor market, depending on whether I include gray and black labor or not, the estimates will be different, but it's not more than 100,000 persons. So from this point of view, it's quite understandable. This is a marginalized question in the public debate. But Hungary is in the first, or if you want, in the third but initial phases of new <coughs> migration phenomena. Now with a change in character and facing all the challenges Professor Kahan has mentioned in the future. <coughs> Hungary is one of the European countries in the most difficult demographic. And despite all the dilemmas of tackling the budgetary deficit and the medium term consequences <coughs> of the crisis, and despite all the emphasis made by the Hungarian government 
for using mainly Hungarian labor reserves for economic development. For a number of reasons already mentioned, Hungary will not be able to avoid. Also, if uh, we make a volume statement, not only should not avoid, but has to try to use as much as possible in the best way the opportunities offered by immigration and by immigration from third world countries. Also, you talked about the reasons for, for the outstanding importance of this issue. <coughs> so, if we start, uh, permanent migration remains significant. <coughs> In the in international migration today is increasingly temporary, short-term, circular, and multi-directional. We, <laughs> we will report about the results. But uh, in Hungary, more than half of the immigration of the last years is a temporary type migration. Of temporary is a concept on the level of infection. Uh, as this trend continues, countries like Hungary that were once relatively unaffected by migration are seeing this phenomenon as a challenge, highlighting the need for migrant integration efforts to be flexible and responsive to the new situation. I didn't use the concept of flex security for this. This is something also to debate how useful the way of thinking in terms of flex security might be for only. Uh, as you told about, and I don't want to expand too much, uh, there is a kind of public anxiety, and sometimes even fears, and especially in this time of economic downturn, uh, and with um, unemployment very high and persisting in Hungary, so, migrants are sometimes perceived as competitors for jobs on the Hungarian labor market, exercising <coughs> downward pressure on salaries as a burden on the welfare system. I have to say, in our research, absolutely no evidence for this. The opposite is true. These perceptions are largely unfounded, in Hungary at least. Migrants tend to concentrate in just a few sectors. Construction, seasonal work in agriculture, special commercial activities for the, with the Asian community, typically, for instance, domestic services, <coughs> healthcare, and also some top level multinational people working in the, in the sphere of multinational enterprises. These sectors tend to be those in which there is a deficit in the Hungarian labor market. So, there is no, I'm not against competition, don't misunderstand me, but there is no real competition on the Hungarian labor market between labor force coming from third countries and the Hungarian active population. So, uh, I have to speak about the concept of integration, key for our research, but key as a social and political and economic and cultural challenge for the Hungarian society as a whole. There are four basic forms of social integration, acculturation, placement, interaction, and identity. <coughs> Acculturation, or if you like it better, socialization is the process by which an individual and also a community, a small group, acquires knowledge, cultural standards, and competencies able <coughs> to interact successfully in a society. In Hungary, as we know in the past two decades, the ethnic Hungarians' immigration has been prevailing in Hungary. From 
which, which, which is very well changing in the last few years and will change even more in the future. But at the moment, because of this fact and because of the prevailing percentage of immigrants came from the neighboring country, the problem of acculturation is not very high from a Hungarian perspective. Uh, the second key issue is replacement or structural integration. Structural integration means an individual is, is a concept related to the social <coughs> reproduction process. Uh, an individual gaining a position in society in educational, economic systems, in the professions, or, and very importantly, as a citizen. Also, placement means not just an individual position, but also the rights related to it, the rights associated with particular positions, and the opportunity to establish social relations and to win cultural, social, and economic Capital. The cultural, social, and economic capital from a given conceptual framework <coughs> are key issues for third country immigrants <coughs> in Hungary. Acculturation is, of course, a precondition for placement. Interaction is the third dimension. Interaction is the formation of relationships and networks by individuals who share a mutual ori orientation. This includes friendships. Migrants even have sometimes sex. Surprising, but so. So romantic relationships or marriages or more general membership of social groups. The fourth dimension is identification, referring to an individual identification with a social system. The person sees him or herself as part of a collective body or excluded from it. Uh, identification has both cognitive and emotional aspects. Um, to go further in conceptualizing uh, integration, there are different perspectives to look at the phenomena of uh, integration. Uh, as it relates to the relationship between the incoming groups, the immigrants, and the native population, the hosting society. The first issue is the social integration of migrants into the existing systems of the receiving society. From the other side, the consequences of social integration for the social structures of the receiving society. So there is an important immigrants and on the receiving society. And the overall consequences of social integration or partial or non-integration for the societal integration or system integration of the receiving society. Facing immigration in Hungary and receiving <coughs> Uh, our immigrants with smiling Hungarian society will change, has to change, and does change. Uh, well, maybe I don't enter details now, the different aspects of. of integration more in details. Just uh, to go more in detail with social integration. Social integration can be defined as the inclusion and acceptance of immigrants into the core institutions, relationships, and positions of a whole society. This is very importantly an interactive process between immigrants and the whole society. For the whole society, Integration means opening up institutions and granting equal opportunities to immigrants. But there is no balance. The main responsibility is on our side and not on the side of migrants. In this interaction, the whole society has more resources, more power, 
and more prestige. Because integration is also a kind of power relation. Don't forget it. Uh, integration is not the only possible outcome of the arrival of immigrants into a society. Instead, there is also the way of reproduction of ethnic identity and integration into an ethnic colony. And this can result social segregation from the majority culture. In segment of integration into a subculture, typically urban underclass, look at Marseille, look at Paris, look at Hamburg, uh, look at Berlin, or in marginalization from both the host society and the ethnic. Uh, in Hungary, this type of colonialization does not exist too much. However, if you look at the specific features, for instance, of the Chinese <coughs> in Hungary, this is clearly a closed society with some characteristics also of ethnic colony. But the, ghetto, the colonialization is not a real top-level political challenge in Hungary. Also from this perspective, I would say, it relates to the debate on multiculturalism in Western Europe. Without willing to enter this debate, because of the lock of this time of colonialization, in Hungary the actual debate is about the acceptance and the ability of acceptance to be different and uh, to reduce prejudices, but the question is not about multiculturalism in the present Hungarian society. Uh, uh, integration is an ongoing process also in Hungary. The policies and requirements of successful integration can be related to the above fourth dimension of social integration, which I mentioned. But the starting point of our research is certainly labor market integration. It's the cornerstone of social integration. There is no social integration without labor market integration. And this is also the main focus of our research. It's maybe something you had no time to mention in detail. But we speak about migration, immigrants, third country workers. This, there is a huge variety and internal heterogeneity within this society. There are two, but at least three strains in the migrant community in Hungary. From one side, elegant people, people like us, international civil servants, managers of top-level companies, or even call center employees. They have more freedom, broad possibilities, better living, and work outstanding as compared to the Hungarian society. Living and working conditions, and this is a growing number in the Hungarian society. Their problem is uh, transnationalism, their problem is Europeanization, and whatever. Nice life, happy life in most cases, and uh, good ways of integration. At the other hand, migrants at the bottom <coughs> of the society treat the job undocumented work, social exclusion, discrimination, and increasing inequalities from the other side. That's the double-faced character. But you, you can find a lot of groups between. For instance, the Chinese small commerce is neither rich of elegant nor the treaty type. So for the small enterprises are a very specific form also, but the only issue, and we don't have time to describe this in very much in detail, this one has to be very careful to generalize on the integration of migrants in Hungary. This is an extremely 
stratified society <coughs> with full social exclusion and with fancy lives. Don't forget this uh, while uh, uh, trying to translate in your activities and way of thinking the results of this research. Uh, I don't enter the taste of labor mobility because I have no time for it. Uh, just mentioning a few key concepts for the understanding of the research result. The concept of temporary and circular migration has already been mentioned. Uh, circular mi migration is a rapidly developing form of migration with a lot of benefits of migration throughout Europe and also in Hungary, also in relation with third country nationals. There are some rapidly developing new forms of circular mobility like expatriation, post need business migration and transnationalism. Uh, I just mentioned maybe the transnationalism where the question of integration with this different schizophrenic, but no, not schizophrenic, with being in full harmony, different type of identities. Uh, it's a very special process, the integration of uh, people in transnational sit uh, situation and way of thinking. In Hungary, the Chinese community has a, and the Vietnamese community, are in a very special position from this point of view. Um, the bounded mobility concept, just one remark, and this is also a recent concept, emphasizing very much the importance of individual characteristics, psychosocial characteristics on the different processes of migration, including labor migration. The adult worker model also just one comment emphasizes the importance of the family dimension of migration and the integration of migrants. Uh, now I have a few minutes just to speak about our research. The title of the research, and this is very important, is challenges of the labor market integration in Hungary, opportunities and limits of third country <coughs> I, I, nationals. The done by Pantare Research Agency, led by Dr. Juhas, you've been sitting there, and once again thank you, supported by the European Integration Fund. And this is not just the financial support, but we appreciate very much the technical, political interest. The DG and the fund have behind this support. The aims of the research have been as follows. First, and of course, an evidence-based description and analysis of the state and processes of the labor market, social and cultural integration of third country nationals in Hungary. Also, the analysis of the Hungarian labor market needs in the limits of possibilities, I have to say, uh, for the employment of third country nationals. Uh, at future scenarios and policy options I have no time to know, but I, all this under the conditions of very, very high uncertainty. How to forecast the participation of certain nationals when we have no clear forecast on the development of the Hungarian okay. So, uh, we made all we could in the limits of the possibilities. Migration research is very difficult. I, I don't understand all the details. It's very difficult in identifying migrants, in sampling uh, with migrant population, and it's very difficult to, to prepare interviews with them. Also, you can't avoid characteristic biases in migration research. Uh, your sample, uh, 
will always have a bias of higher class people, uh, better speaking Hungarian people, dwellers of Budapest and larger communities and so on and so on. So certainly one of the result is that this situation in our south is a bit better than the real situation because of this characteristic biases of standardized migration research. That's the reason. And understanding the complexity of the issue and all the different types of uncertainties, they require the use of multiple complementary methods of information gathering, like literature review, secondary analysis of existing statistical data and empirical literature. Uh, thank you. It, was, it has just been published, the first synthesizing work on the situation of migration in Hungary. One of the authors is here, and uh, we make the presentation. It was very helpful in our work. Maybe we made the first content analysis of the press, of the media, on this issue. Uh, then we have survey and in <coughs> interviews with key informants or experts of the different groups, and quantitative <coughs> survey in the target group, which are third country migrants working in Hungary, using questionnaire and focused interviews with migrants. So, the research has been carried out between September 2010 and April. Uh, 2011, this is just fresh like the bread in front of us Monday morning has been just prepared. It's still a draft. We had 55 specially selected interviews, speaking all the existing languages of different Hungarian communities. Uh, also, <laughs> the selection of the sound has been made partly on the basis of the social network of interviewers, with a lot of benefits, but also a number of risks. This impacts also on the character of the South. We had, finally, 445 valid completed questionnaires with an average length of 86 minutes. Then, in that interviews with migrants, 53 <coughs> expert questionnaires, and 23 expert focused interviews. But we will report on this after the break, after some of the presentations, mainly by the end of the second work session. Now, if you have, I don't give for myself more than two minutes if there are some questions of clarification. But the facts and the evidences of our research will come later. No questions, thank you so much. Uh, now we have a break of 20 minutes. Yes, no? 20 minutes. Yes, and then we go back and we continue. Thank you.